In the Bible, how did Judas Iscariot die? Did he hang himself or did he fall to his death? Today, we're looking at contradictions in the Bible. This is a picture of all the contradictions in the Bible. It was made by a graphic designer and self-proclaimed atheist who was inspired to counter a similar picture of cross-references. Looking at this, there's more contradictions than pet puppy profiles on Instagram. Now, this is a challenging picture, particularly if the Bible is held to contain no errors. So let's take a look at some of these contradictions to see why they exist. There's lots of types of contradictions, but in this episode, we're gonna focus on a specific type where different books report the same information differently. We're gonna look at different reports about King David, contradicting lists of people, and the question of how Judas died. Let's start with Chronicles and Samuel. How much did David pay for the land that would later become the temple in Jerusalem? In Samuel, he pays 50 shekels of silver. In Chronicles, he pays 600 in gold. So in Samuel, David comes across cheaper than a guy who chooses McDonald's on a first date. But in Chronicles, he's out there doling out the cash like he's the host of a Mr. Beast video. If you read both accounts as pure history, as if they were a fly on the wall eyewitness account, then this is a problem. Did he pay 50 in silver or 600 in gold? Now, typically the apologetic answer is that the stories depict David buying different things. So in Samuel, he bought just the threshing floor, a small area used by farmers to separate the unwanted chaff from their wheat. But in Chronicles, he bought the whole place of the threshing floor, which must have included the surrounding fields. This could be true, but the problem is the emphasis just isn't there in the original Hebrew. It says place of the threshing floor, which could include the surrounds, but it also could have just been the threshing floor. The second problem is if two significant transactions took place, a cheap and an expensive one, isn't it a little convenient that both accounts have left one of them out? But if you understand these writings as less of a fly on the wall account and more like historical memory, narratives that are shaped with a purpose that involves molding the minds of their readers, then this apparent contradiction is not really a problem. Chronicles and Samuel have different perspectives on David and different purposes in the way that they tell their stories. In Chronicles, the higher amount described as the full price portrays the importance of the temple. It's invaluable, and so the price paid should reflect that. In Samuel, the connection between the threshing floor, land, and the temple is never really made explicitly. It wasn't as important for that narrative. And so there are these differences between Chronicles and Samuel because of different narrative perspectives. Let's try a different example. What about biblical family trees? Just like your uncle who bought a Viking helmet because he's discovered he's 2% Norwegian from a 23andMe DNA test, ancestry was also a big deal in the Bible. The Bible has lists of genealogies, which is just a nerdy way of saying family line. And some of these genealogies in the Bible have some inconsistencies. Consider David again. Is he Jesse's eighth son, as in 1 Samuel 16, or is he the seventh son, as per 1 Chronicles 2? What about Enoch? Is he the sixth generation from Adam, as per Genesis 5, or is he the seventh, as per Jude? How about Matthew's genealogy of Jesus? straight up leaving out some of the generations listed in Chronicles. The truth is, biblical genealogies work differently to our notion of historical family trees. Genealogies tell a story, not just the history of a family. For example, the number seven was important. It was an ideal number with a lot of symbolism. And sometimes someone like David or Enoch might get shifted into the number seventh slot because they were an important figure. That's the same reason that Matthew omits a few people from his list, so that it works out to be multiples of seven. The authors aren't trying to be contradictory, but they are selective about what was important to the narrative that was being told. So let's up the difficulty a little. What about the death of Judas? You know, the guy who tops the list of famous betrayals right above Brutus and Caesar and LeBron ditching the calves. The Book of Acts and Matthew famously have contradictory accounts of Judas's death. 
Both describe the purchase of a field with Judas's money and his subsequent death causing it to have the name Field of Blood. However, Matthew describes Judas as hanging himself, while Acts suggests that he fell and his guts spilled out. When did this turn into an episode of horrible histories? So how did Judas die? Augustine tried to hold them together, suggesting that the rope snapped and his body burst open. Others have put a more modern twist on this, suggesting that Acts is simply describing his body being found rather than the body falling. Creative solutions, and sure, they are possible, but it's unsatisfying for a lot of people because if something so intense happened, why did Matthew and Luke both decide to leave key bits out? And sure, one possibility is they both took their accounts from different traditions that had different perspectives on describing the same event. But it may not be possible to reconcile the two accounts in this way. In fact, these passages are what led famous Christian author C.S. Lewis to say, It seems to me that this and other facts rule out the view that every statement in Scripture must be historical truth. That didn't mean he didn't think there was any historical truth to the Gospels, quite the contrary. But he understood that they communicated truths in a very different way than we do. The writers of the New Testament were less concerned with how Judas died and more concerned with why he died. For Luke, in the book of Acts, Judas' death was necessary to explain the choosing of a new disciple to replace Judas. In Matthew, however, there are extended references and quotations to the Old Testament, including Jeremiah 19 and Zechariah 11. Matthew appears to be using Judas' death to provide a sort of social and biblical commentary, for example, connecting Judas' death to the destruction of Jerusalem and the spilling of innocent blood in Jeremiah 19. The gruesome accounts of his death may also be a way that early Jewish writers showed God's disfavor or judgment. Matthew and Luke had different ways of using the death of Judas to further their message. The truth is it is unlikely that we could ever reconstruct how a historical Judas died. But that's not the point of either story. As modern readers looking for truth in the text, our priority might be historical reconstruction, but we shouldn't assume that the ancient authors shared that same priority. Writers of the Bible were more concerned with constructing their narratives in a way that made sense to their readers and communicated the broader message of their writing. Contradictions like this are really only problems if we are trying to forcibly combine different accounts together, like some sort of Frankenstein's jigsaw puzzle. Different books have different contexts they were written in, and the authors had different goals when writing. So trying to force harmonization can actually go against the intention with which the book was written. But these contradictions in no way discount the message that these authors were trying to communicate. In future episodes, we'll look at even more contradictions between the Gospels, between laws in the Old Testament, and much more. If you want to see more of this series, make sure to leave a like, and share this video and subscribe to the channel. I'm Lachlan and I'll see you on the next episode of Bible Unboxed.